Well, hello again. It's David Willey here from the Tank Museum. Obviously, still not at the Tank Museum. At this particular moment in time, I'm doing another question and answer session from the back garden. And uh, again, I repeat every time, if you know the format, you know the format. Otherwise, I'm answering questions people have sent in, some from the comments, some people have emailed in. And at the same time, I try and flog you a few of the things that we're selling on our online shop which is really good because it helps support the museum. Good news, we're open. Please book in advance if you're coming. If you've got the opportunity to come down, we're open seven days a week, normal times, but we do need to know you're coming, if you see what I mean. So we're, we've been able to expand the numbers of likelihood you will be able to get in, but we do need to know you're coming. So, so still have a look at our website if you want to come along. Um, and the other good bit of news, we were filming in the week with David Fletcher, so he's back up coming into the museum. So hopefully fairly shortly, we'll be able to see some tank chats with David Fletcher online again. So that's uh, another bit of good news. I'm sure all of you will appreciate out there. And I have to mention the fact I've always got my dog with me here. So um, uh, throwing the ball for Finn. So um, that's part of the show. Um, just having a look now. Oh, I shouldn't have. He's got a squeaky ball, apologies if you're listening to something, I've forgot that. Um, let's get on with some questions. Um, GHKB64 asks a question, what happens to outdated tanks? And they, he's given a reference there, like uh, what happens to the German Panzer I between when they were being used in Poland and what happens when uh, in 1940 when they go off to France. Um, if you're looking at the Germans, the Germans are very good at recycling their vehicles. There's very little chance uh, a vehicle that's been built by the Germans or that they've overseen in the factories, such as the Czech 38Ts, etc. The likelihood is they are going to end up being, even if they're not in frontline service, being reused for, for example, policing operations in the Balkans or behind the lines on the Eastern Front, or rebuilt as another model. So for example, some assault guns were built on top of the Panzer I chassis and the turrets were also reused. So nothing seems to go to waste as it were. And of course, some vehicles were downgraded for the training remit. Bring it round here, come on, <coughs> round here. Talk to me like that. Um, there we go. So nothing much goes to waste from the Germans point of view. And one of the figures I found out, 250 Panzer I turrets um, in March 1945 on a return were listed as being, 161 of them were being used as static defences on positions in the Balkans, 76 on the Eastern Front, three on the West Wall, and 20 on fortifications in Denmark. So again, tank turrets are sometimes used in static fortifications. And uh, another a whole topic there, Panthers, the actual turrets were not just reused from knocked out Panthers, but actually Panther turrets were manufactured specifically for going on to defenses on concrete bases. So they just have a turret ring done. Certain types of designs were, were sent out, how thick the concrete should be, etc and tank uh, turrets like the Panther ones in place. Finn, come around here. 123, we think, Panther turrets um, are known. Ooh, hit the camera. Um, 123 were known to have uh, definitely gone out um, and been placed in one particular order we saw. So there we go. Right, next question. Ketten Hun 31 asks a question about transporting tanks in the First World War. And he says about the railway transportation of tanks um, how were, did they go about removing the sponsons or were they pushed in, etc.? So, story behind that. The Mark I tanks had the sponsons bolted on from the outside and when they needed to be moved, and most movement of tanks was done by rail um, from the factories, obviously they go down to Avonmouth, they put it on a ship, uh, they're taken over to France, but then they're transported by rail. And the idea was each tank should have, when it's being transported, a sponson trolley that goes with it. So just think of a flatbed trolley, wooden based, wooden wheels, and we have one actually in the tank museum on display. And the idea was you unbolted your sponsons, 
they were lifted off and placed on the trolley and strapped down and the trolley was towed by the tank that the sponsons came off. And there's a whole issue here because once you took the sponsons off, when the vehicle drove, as it would have to do, to get onto, normally up a ramp, then onto the flatbed trucks that it was going to be on the railway beds that it was going to be taken and used on as it were to be transported quite often the frames flexed and when you went to put bolt the sponsons back on the sides quite often they had a lot of trouble sometimes having to reaming out the bolt holes to flex because the whole thing had moved when it was been going you know on this transportation and being moved around because those sponsons ended up being almost structurally trying to keep it straight and together so a lot of issues a lot of time spent on trying to get those removed and basically as i say so the tank drives on and it pulls behind it the trolley that goes onto the flatbed off they go driven off off straight off the other end onto another ramp that goes down and then you end up putting the sponsons back on two beams placed over the top of the tank with block and tackle on so you lift up on one side put into place and then you put your bolt holes through to try and secure it again so it was a time consuming and very you can read all the accounts soldiers hated doing it because of the problems it caused and the the fuss and bother so when the mark IV comes along they've overcome this and instead of being bolted onto the outside, they're bolted from the inside, the sponsons. You can undo those bolts and they can be pushed inside far enough to meet the railway gauge. So what's the railway gauge? The whole point of why you need to move these is because the vehicle becomes too wide on the carriage. And if you, as you're being transported, if you meet a train or something coming the other way, those overhanging sponsons could hit uh, an oncoming train. So just before the First World War, 1912, they sit down in Switzerland, they do something called the Bern Convention, which is basically they, they draw up a loop and they say everything must be able to fit through. And uh, it's actually enacted um, just after, um, it, it comes into effect as it were, just before the First World War in 1914. And the Bern Cove gauge, as it's often known, it's got 10 foot four, in other words, three meters, 15 centimeters width. For height, 10 foot five, three meters, 17 centimeters, but it's dome shaped. So the highest point in the middle you're allowed on the Bern Convention is 14 foot one inch, which is about four meters, 28 centimeters for that middle bit. So a dome shape, that's what they considered was acceptable. Um, you could go over that, but then you had to, number one, reconnoiter the track so that there was no bridges or something you were going to hit, and there was no train coming the other way. So the oversized loads were possible, um, but to fit that gauge, they thought it more sensible that they make sure the sponsons are removable or could be pushed inside. And, and this follows another question that came along, which is, the, could you swap sponsons, etc.? No, because they're different shape for the male and female. Male tanks, six pounder guns, females, machine guns. Um, the females on the Mark IV, they're a smaller protuberance, but they actually have a split down the middle and they're hinged either side, though they can be pushed in. Oops, I'm gonna lose everything here. Wind's getting up. Um, so you can't, someone said, could you swap the sponsons? No, you can't, because they're different sizes and also inside the tank, if you're built as a male, you have different stowage arrangements for the six pounder ammunition than what you would have if you were built as a female. And uh, the females, again, you know, very different arrangements to carry the ammunition inside and those smaller doors, much harder to get out of a female tank than a male. Um, so I hope, I, I think that kind of answers that one, how you move your tanks around. Um, uh, but it was never an easy task. And uh, again, another one of those ones, you know, if you look at Combray, they actually move the tanks to one of the railheads, fix all the fascines, and then even with these massive fascines, they then go up towards the front line because they've reconnoitred, they know the fascines will fit on the route they're gonna choose before they're driven off against down these ramps. Um, so I hope that answers that one. Um, 
Phil Dyson answers uh, asks another question, which, you know, when I was saying about whatever happens in a tank, you tend to get wet, i.e. water finds its way in. What happens about the electrics? Um, it is a problem. Electrics do suffer. And that's why everything inside a tank, if you look at it, why, well, again, that specification, you know, it's a little box, but it's hardwired. It's got some protection on because a foot's going to land on top of it or something else as well. So everything tends to be pretty beefy inside a vehicle or if it is wiring it's either cased or it's protected in some way and it's certainly put in a manner that hopefully you don't go and snag things on it um, or allow as water because condensation water is going to be around the place inside a tank pretty much whatever you do therefore you have to protect the electrics from um, getting shorts, etc. So that's one another reason why everything inside a vehicle, military spec, tends to be that much higher because it's it's inevitable that water's going to be gushing around and flowing about things. And of course, there's a fuse board as well, so you're going to do shorts and um, have to replace some fuses at certain times. Um, Tim Cook asked a question about the G10 watch I'm wearing. You know, tell us something about G10 watches. So. I've already mentioned, I think, military watches, the whole point about the military, they needed accurate timepieces for, I think, I'd like to think they're fairly obvious reasons. If you're going to start a barrage, there's no point starting um, two minutes early, two minutes late, whatever. You need to be on time because that can be critical for the infantry to advance, for all your other arms to come into service. If you're all on different time zone, uh, timepieces, different uh, um, settings you need accurate watches now that's been an issue for the military different times of conflict they've ordered up different uh, swiss movements they've had rolexes they've had all sorts of different things going into military service but uh, a chap ray meller who was ex uh, merchant marine he worked at one point he'd worked for a watch companies and saw how the mod was kind of running out of sources for some of these and decided there was going to be a gap in the market especially as some of the major suppliers had dropped out because there wasn't a big enough military orders coming in um, so he just set up something called the Cabot Watch Company CWC and I think it's about 71 and in 1980 I think it is they come out with their first G10 watch which was nicknamed the fat boy because it had a fairly fat case for the movement that was imported from Switzerland. I think it was 17 jewels or something other like movement. And uh, they found, you know, the market with the British Ministry of Defence and supplied them with um, what is seen to be for many a very simple, classic designed watch face. And that's why I think people, including myself, like them. It's not just because it's military, it's because it's just a very simple, stylish face that does what you need it to do plainly and clearly, which is another major issue because however stylish your watches are these days, for a military man, he doesn't want to have to be faffing around working out which way his watch is up or if those, you know, they've done symbols or something else. No, he needs to know. So that's why the CWC watch, um, they were made, first of all, now they're digital, or, you know, they're electronic, they were earlier were, were, were wind up ones and everything. I believe, and I'm not sure if it's true, but the G10 was the name of the form you were supposed to fill in to get one of those military watches. And uh, there's a big hoo-ha there because you can imagine who gets a watch, why, when. Most people have their own watches these days, so are fewer being issued. When are they issuing specialist watches? So they're, again, for the collector's market, you know, at certain times, submariners, um, special forces, you know, did they have a special type of watch? Um, because of their particular needs and therefore there's a collector's market out there for all of those ones. There's probably more being worn by uh, private individuals like myself and everything than the military ever, you know, used as, um, from that point of view. And I can't remember the name of the company that does them now that they do a similar one, but typically there's a snobbism about all of these things. You know, CWC ones are considered okay and wearable. Earlier ones, I mentioned my story about losing my Hamilton on the beach years ago. Um, but actually the later ones, everyone sneers at those and not being real thing, you know, so CWC are the ones, you know, I should probably show you this, shouldn't I? Let me just walk up to the camera and uh, hopefully you can see that. That's a CWC watch there and I think this one's 1990 or something or other, um, but it's that idea of the plain face and military straps as well. So there we go, that's about um, 
CWC watches. Let me get this for the dog. Um, right, on with now, what's next? Um, Andrew Dash asked a question about whether people move between squadrons during their service with, for example, a tank regiment. And I've talked in previous tank chats trying to break down who did what where. Um, Mets, if you were a sergeant or if you had a promotion, quite often they'd move you from the immediate squadron if they had the opportunity to, because of course at certain times they just don't have that luxury, but it was the idea, so especially if you were an officer, you tended, if you were promoted from the ranks, you tended to go and serve elsewhere first um, to break yourself in, as it were, and so you didn't have that embarrassment of the guy who you used to be a mucker with is all of a sudden supposed to be saying sir to you, etc., and the awkwardness that might cause. Um, but yes, people did move quite regularly. You were, were moved within a unit, it was where you were needed. So even though there is a fundamental, you know, you'll read about how they get used to the idea, they like certain officers, they like certain sergeants, they think their crew should stay together, but you'll find it's a whole range of reasons is they need replacements elsewhere, they need experienced men, they need people to go off on training courses to get genned up ready for whatever's coming to service next. So th movement is going on, let alone casualties, when all of a sudden a whole unit may find itself decimated. And that's one of the reasons they have uh, left out of action troops, is sometimes they know they need men enough men to help formulate the unit next time round so you don't have the situation where is it come on bring it around here Finn. um you don't have the situation of uh of everybody with the experience potentially either being wounded or out of action in one combat so you've still got enough experience around the place and these are all those sorts of problems co's of units have in balancing that and finding the right men for the right roles, you know, so that's another one of those complexities that looking at the tanks and everything, we, um, we don't look at so much, which I recommend again, go back, we've still got it in stock, that Mark Urban book on the, the Filthy Fifth, Fifth Royal Tank Regiment, because he takes you through some of those issues of who's the CO, how are they influenced and what uh, different people get up to. Let me have a slurp, I do apologise, you're going to have to hear this because it's next to the microphone, or close your ears now if you don't like hearing these sounds. Still a nice day, we've had some rain, but still a nice warm day. I love my tank mugs, still available from the Tank Museum. Or of course, you might fancy getting yourself a Tiger Day mug. Um, we have a number of those. Um, right, where do we get to? So we've done that one about movement between units. Um, Mark Sullivan, thank you very much. He sent me a link to uh, those Lego, someone doing a whole Cambrai tank battle in Lego. Fantastic, you know, the imagination and the way they filmed it, really very good. Um, AS03, is it UK? Um, and also Graham Trowell, thank you very much. You've offered um, to either buy, and I'm suggesting, do you remember I said about these lovely models you can put together? I haven't actually got a made up one here. We sell those in the shop, they're all of six pounds. Um, but uh, if you get in touch, send an email to info at Tank Museum, um, AS03 UK. Um, because then I will send you some of these and if you can, I'll either make them up or if you don't if you want to have a go at it, and thank you Graham for offering to do that as well, um, we'll get those on that grave of the RTR trooper, then Derek Henry Rose, uh, and replace the ones that were stolen. So give us a yell and don't forget we've got those in the shop. Other things you might want to have a play with. Um, Monty's Fighting. Um, ah, here we go, right. So he was talking about um, an account where a uh, Churchill tank with a 30 calibre Browning added to the top and he asked the question, you know, what was the policy on adding extra weapons to tanks? And uh, I think this comes back again to that point I made earlier. It's up to really the unit commander. There's some people don't seem to like it and want their vehicles to be very spick span meeting the regulations. There's others and again, famously, the 8th Army was, you know, when they met up with 5th Army in North Africa and Tunisia and that, you know, they were considered to be like gypsies because the amount of stuff, they jokingly say that phrase, you know, that the, they got carried with them on the back that was non-regulation. And, you know, there's those lovely photographs of one of them sitting there by his armoured car with a rather swanky... Um, 
pagoda thing that he's nicked from some cafe in Cairo. And they'd, they'd add anything they wanted to make their lives easier. And the same with weaponry. If you captured something, oh, let's have a play with this. Let's see where we can do it. So you'll see, certainly in the desert campaign, loads of vehicles are ended up having extra things that they've either captured from the Italians or sometimes later the Germans. The problem is the sustainability, as we've mentioned before, with captured stuff. But if you've managed to whip a 30 calibre Browning off maybe a wrecked vehicle or you've got access to something somewhere along the lines, that's another one of those things that you can see in some units, especially scout vehicles and everything else. You know, sometimes the plethora of different weapons that they seem to have got the fitter to weld a bracket on somewhere so they can have something extra. And I think it's also another issue is so if whether the CO allows that to happen, if it's useful, fine. And also it's the nature of the type of campaign they're, they're engaged in. And again, towards the end of the war, if you look at from the Rhine crossing going onwards and the number of accounts where no one, this issue, no one wants to be one of the last tank crewmen to die. So this idea, the phrase they use, brassing up, if there's a hedge down the side of the road, he's got a bit of suspicions about, this is the time they will be brassing up the phrase. So firing 303 or whatever it is they've got in terms of their secondary armament, along that hedge line in case there's some die-hard Nazi sitting there with the Panzerfaust. So the more opportunities you or the commander might have for some close-in weapon um, to be able to do that with, the better. Um, so hence uh, that people would add things. So I, I know a lot of you out there, your model makers and everything, when you look at all those photos, where is it, Finn? I can't see it. Where's it gone? Where's he put it? Oh, make me come and get it, won't you? Um, so if you look at all those photographs, you can see um, a huge range and diversity of extra weapons that some vehicles have fitted or had available to them just in case sort of thing that you can see there and undoubtedly used because you won't be carrying too much stuff um, because it's more space, you know, so, it's, um, so unless it was useful. Um, right, what else have we got? Uh, Speedy 3 came back and he told us all the story of when the Canadians were getting rid of their Leopard 1s because again it was a country that had decided actually we can do the tank roll with a wheeled vehicle like Stryker, put a gun on top of that etc and we could do that and then Afghanistan kicked off Canadian forces out there, woohoo, you know we realised we need a tank again. Now I mentioned this one because thank you for saying that story but I remember at the time um, we heard about, now there's, a, there's always a Canadian liaison officer braced at the Army Trials and Development Unit. He's always second in command at Bovington. So we always got on very well with our Canadian friends out there. And of course, you know, um, us being the tank museum, we heard this was going on and we happened to say, listen chaps, what's the chance of, uh, if you're getting rid of some of those, could we have some? And um, anyway, we ended up getting a that stunning amount of vehicles from the uh, Canadian Defence Forces when they were going out of service. So we ended up with some M548s, which we use as our ride vehicles. They're basically the M113 running gear, track, etc. engine, but with a load carrying back. We fitted them with bus seats. We drive them around giving people rides. Um, so we ended up with that. We ended up with an M113 um, from Canadian service that was going out of service with the Canadian Defence Forces. And we said, you know, what's the chance of the leopard? And we ended up with two leopards um, that came across in the Batters boat. And it was, I have to say, one of the most pleasurable and easiest uh, acquisitions a tank museum's ever done. Um, and I, I mention it because I dug out my letter. Um, so we were exchanging letters at the time, getting all this thing sorted. We went through the second in command, as I mentioned, who's uh, the Canadian officer at the time to the High Commission in London, to the Canadian Defence Ministry. And this is actually the letter I ended up getting in March of 2006 from the Honourable Gordon J. O'Connor, who was the Defence Minister in Canada at the time. And he says, going through there about what we can do, thanks for those um, the request and everything. And he actually ends up by saying this, I wish to take this opportunity to thank you and your museum for your endeavour to preserve tanks from around the world, history will be rewarded by your efforts. That's not bad getting it from the minister level, isn't it? So um, thank you so much again to our Canadian friends for supplying those vehicles and uh, 
long may it continue is all I can say. So uh, again, you know, and I know there's a whole load of Canadians out there that watch that, but I, uh, I dug that one out because thanks for relating the story. In a weird way, we were some of the beneficiaries of when you first took out those leopards. No one's ever come back actually and said, can we have them back? We uh, realised they knew them. And I know you've had more leopards now go into service. Um, James Wilford asked a question about what have you, unarm, um, unmanned armoured vehicles in the future um, and what's that going to have an effect? It's already happening. Um, some of these concepts for unmanned vehicles can we remotely control? My own gut feeling is yes, I think many armoured vehicles are going to go the way of aircraft, which are they, or UAVs, you know, where they will be remotely controlled by someone, whether they need to be on the battlefield to do it from a mother craft equivalent, you know, a, a mother ship um, vehicle, or whether it can be from miles and miles away, as is done with drones. Um, Already they're thinking tactics for this, so might you have swarm vehicles that go out ahead of your main vehicle? Um, do you put firepower or missiles on those swarm vehicles? Are they going to be used to reveal positions? Are they going to be used to do the things, the dirty work that you don't want to risk a life on? Um, and at the same time, you made the point in your question, which is, I've got a gut feeling we'll still have the need for manned vehicles because so often the human interface with the enemy, with prisoners of war, with the civilian population, with everything else, you want to see a face, which is why some of these unmanned vehicles that the Israelis have got, where they're servicing or they're patrolling some of their um, borders and airfields, etc., they've actually put a television screen on them so that if they do come up to people, you can actually talk to a real face because people want to interact. So there's a whole host of other reasons you might want a crewman around not just about the combat situation and saving that crewman's risking their lives sort of thing so uh, watch this space because it's an area where I think there's a lot of rapid development there's already been unmanned vehicles out there for some time but it's one of these ones where again taking from other areas um, look at all the experimentation doing with so you know driverless cars and everything else what's going to be lifted from a civilian marketplace and being made to work effectively in the military sphere probably quite quickly. Um, so it's another one there. Garrett asks the question, how much were my slacks? I imagine you mean my trousers. Um, five pounds from a charity shop. I nearly found the light label for you, but uh, um, most of my clothing, apart from underwear and socks, comes from charity shops, so I always keep the label. Um, but uh, I would have shown you, but there we are, five pounds if it helps you, probably about six dollars. Um, so where do we go to? Um, John Peterson asked the question about when 11th Armoured Division and uh, 29th Armoured Brigade, they were being equipped with Comet tanks in December of 1944, but they don't actually see any use till about March 45. Why was that? Um, well, the story is that one of the Royal Tank Regiments was actually starting to hand in at the end of November starting to hand in its Shermans ready and they're starting training ready to get um, equipped with a new Comet tank and then the German attack that we know as the Battle of the Bulge took place and they were literally going back to the station to get their Shermans again that they'd handed in and to go to the River Mers and to be blocking positions, Dinant, etc. So that delayed the training and the issuing of these Comet tanks. So we don't actually really see them in any sort of operational use until the following March of 45, where they do see use, uh, you know, Rhine crossing to the end uh, of the war. So the Comet is a tank that's seen service that way. And when I was looking, I saw quite an interesting summary document of about some of the developmental issues, because one of the other problems they had, even though the Comet proved to be a reliable tank, some of the first ones that went out there had real problems with their final drives. And uh, later there was stowage issues and all sorts of things, you know, that they were learning that again in the documentation was there was an air of disappointment that they kind of thought these should not have happened. We should have ironed these out by now by the time of going there. But the overall report on the comet is very favourable because it's basically a souped up Cromwell, same meteor engine, so speed is good. They, when they get that mechanical reliability is good, 
but they really like that 77 millimeter gun as they call it um, basically a three inch gun with a the projectile from the 17 pounder they like that because it is a accurate gun and it's very good firepower as well so you know it's penetration as i've mentioned before if you look at all the range tables and everything actually with firing discarding sabo that gun could penetrate more armor than the 75 on a panther so you know and a powerful bit of uh, kit there um but the reasoning so it's it's it, there was a hiccup in the issuing really of those tanks um, before they went out um, now there's another question which is where did I actually have the question um, someone asked the question where is it gone about the youth of the um, mock-up panther tanks in the Battle of the Bulge I'll just mention that campaign um, what happens is Otto Scarenzi is asked by Hitler to form this kind of commando unit that are going to disrupt, go ahead of the, some parachuted, um, some going infiltrating in American uniforms, the Battle of the Bulge basically, to go ahead. We've all seen photographs and you know, the, this, this um, nervousness it puts into the American troops and uh, putting everyone off guard. Are they really, you know, what's the code word of the day? How do I tell if you're really uh, a, a, an American and not a German dressed as an American? And Scorenzi's basically Hitler is actually asked him to a meeting and he's given a bit of a, you know, we're going to be doing this, we're going to have all these different things and you're going to be able to have all these captured vehicles to use and form this commando unit to go ahead. What actually happens, though, is again, the promise is there. What really comes in really disappoints Scorenzi. And he says about this in his memoirs because he'd been promised a lot of stuff. Um, not a lot turned up and even he was kicking OKW high command because number one is they sent out first of all they go and send out orders which seem to be very open to everybody we need American speakers language experts people who can you know lived in America etc which gave the game away Scorenzi thought too much their secrecy wasn't good enough and it turns out a Dutch guy did actually end up um, hearing all this and um, you know, the Americans were given some warning of it. Um, but he also found that they weren't following up on these promises of captured vehicles. Because again, if you're a unit and you've got a couple of captured American GMC trucks, as long as you can get fuel, they're really useful trucks to keep in service. So, you know, frontline or behind the line units are very reluctant to surrender the equipment that he's going to need. And at one point, you know, he's, um, he's chasing for vehicles. He gets in the end 15 tanks, 20 armoured cars, 100 jeeps and 20 self-propelled guns and 120 trucks. Um, or that's what his aim was. What actually turned up is a lot, lot less, which is why at one point he ends up getting five Panthers. He's got five Stugs as well are given to him because they end up, they haven't got enough running American armour so they convert those Panthers into looking like an M10 tank destroyer. And uh, that process that goes on with a bit of sheet metal on the outside, and they do look quite effective, you know, they've got the right turret shape. But the reasoning for that, because by the time the operation starts, he, he did end up with about two Shermans, but one of them broke down, didn't really work. So he's only got one real Sherman that he can use. Um, and the irony, of course, is they're going to capture a load of uh, uh, abandoned American equipment, you know, in quite large quantities in those initial waves of the Battle of the Bulge. And again, his whole unit, what the aspiration was, how many they ended up, three battalions, etc., was all the idea, all this vehicle kit. It just doesn't happen in the way they wanted it to. So uh, an awful lot down. And the aim, by the way, they were going to try and capture a couple of bridges across the Meurs. They don't get that far. They're um, Neil Malmody. Most of them get knocked out, certainly these uh, Panthers. Uh, and they have the same problem as so many of the other German units at the time is the vehicles are OK, but they just don't get a, haven't got enough fuel keeping up with them to keep them going. So in the end, a number of these vehicles are abandoned before they're even knocked out in combat. Um, small point for your model makers. I know you love all these things. How did they tell? How are they going to differentiate all the captured or converted vehicles had a small yellow triangle on the back of the turrets or the back of the vehicle and that was going to be an indicator for other German troops 
that this was one of ours. If it's going up the road, it's not just a retreating or, uh, you know, uh, American vehicles there. Um, and another thing that they, they said as well was when approaching areas, they should keep their guns at nine o'clock, don't have them facing at 12 o'clock forward. So in other words, they look less threatening. And, uh, you know, that was another indicator. It was going to be one of our vehicles, i.e. a German vehicle, even if it looks like an American one, that's an indicator for you as well as that yellow triangle if you saw the back. Um, so anyway, I hope that answers. And the other thing that just on that score, I was going through in one of the boxes on the Panther and I photocopied here. This was much later, but on the 4th of April, there's actually a report uh, written out with photographs of um, an intelligence summary explaining what the Germans had actually done to make those M10. So it goes through about, you know, sheet metal used in camouflaging uh, was of two thicknesses, three twenty seconds of an inch and nine sixty four of an inch, and in some places double sheets were applied. And it goes through the photographs, false lifting rings, everything else there, what was done. So at the time there was actually intelligence and uh, photographs from that report I just took there of uh, of those for intelligence summary. So whether they thought they were going to meet them again or what, you know, just feeling they needed to um, actually explain what has happened there. But um, that was in the archive box as well. I found quite interesting. Um, so I think that kind of comes through this session of questions I've answered there. Um, things I can tell you or things I can sell you rather. Um, I've already mentioned those lovely models again, these ones, which again, very simple, wooden dowels, wooden MDF, go together, you can paint them, do whatever you like with them. Um, we've got a Second World War tank there turreted, but also we've done that nice shape of the First World War tanks. Um, six pounds, again, go to the online shop. Other books, some of these I've mentioned before, 399, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. So going uh, through some of those people behind the scenes that were coming up with those innovative weapons that, um, and I know some of you have read it and said very good. This was one, and again, I £2.99. If you like your RAF stuff and your story, this is a great big thick tome with an enormous amount of research in about all the guys who their escapes in the Second World War, RAF crewmen, did they get away, how far did they get, what happened to them, etc. And it is one of these stunning, I just couldn't believe the amount of work that's gone into this when you look at it, and we've got it for sale for £2.99. So if you're a uh, bit of an RAF buff and uh, it's still going well and I, well, I gave me the excuse to bring it out again £6.99 the softback version where we got the hardback one of that lovely tank book um, and someone stopped me in the shop the other day and was just saying you know what do I get that's just a good picture book with everything in so we can look up I still recommend this one it's got a lot from the collection in beautiful photography by DK and you can buy it at a really good knockdown price so if you haven't got it yet whether you're in entry level or real enthusiastic level, you know, model maker, historian, whatever, I'd still recommend it because there's cracking stuff in here, really good imagery, a lot of our collection as well as some others and some great, you know, photo shoots inside some of those um, key tanks as well. So that's why I brought that one out again. I've mentioned our uh, mugs. I'll have another quick slurp. He says it's probably cold by now. We've just restocked with Kobe, so there's a lot of Kobe. That's our Tiger model, but go online if you like these ones. I know a number of you kind of reviewed them for us. Great, they're brick-built ones, but still fairly complex, but you can get different level ones. Um, so there's Kobe stuff. Another one of those books we're selling off really cheap. Um, I've mentioned it before, Albert Speer, Inside the Third Reich. Really, really interesting read. and. Uh, his behind the scenes as it were what it was like at the top in nazi germany and all his efforts for get, trying to get manufacturing going and then kind of like how he falls out of favor at the end with hitler but hitler still admires him from his earlier work and they you know uh he, he's he admired his architectural work and everything and if you do find that fascinating i'd strongly again recommend afterwards after you're reading that if you haven't had enough of Albert Speer, read that Geeti Sereni book, Albert Speer, his battle with the truth. You know, where was Albert Speer misremembering or did he lie or did he, you know, because there's things he's saying I didn't know about. 
come on, you know, what did you know about then? And Gita Serini did a major series of interviews with him and wrote a stunningly interesting book, as she did on some other um, key Nazis, uh, Camp Commander. And I know all of you are going to be saying, what else have you got there? Um, don't forget, if, uh, you know, if you need the excuse for buying it for somebody else, or yourself, of course, you can get a Tank Commander Bear. We, not, sorry, can you see in the bag? I didn't take it out because the dog will have it. Uh, plush toy, but it's one of those Sherman tanks there as a plush toy with a slightly droopy barrel at the moment. A bit like our slippers, but there you go. All right, drop it. Um, and what else was I going to tell you on that one? So, and of course, I still think we've got our, if you're really interested in a fin puppet, there's a fin puppet there who comes with his own little uh, signature. And I, uh, again, saw some of you admiring. We're now doing cotton face masks, so they're washable but we've got ones with microphones, so you can have your tank museum one with a microphone on, going around the front there, or, and I know this will get you all excited, you can actually get one done with a David Fletcher moustache on. So um, they're for sale now, they'll be on our website, or they are on our website, made of cotton, so if you do want to buy one and you can put it through the wash and wear it whenever you uh, fancy as uh, everyone's having to around the museum at the way moment, or wearing that, or oh, on a couple of uh, polo tops down the front there, I think we've got one with a tank museum on and one with uh, a tiger on or something or other. So as ever, what I recommend you do is after you've done all your clicking and subscribing and whatever, you go to the tank museum website, have a look at the shop there, the online shop, and this stuff and lots of other things, our famous inflatable tank shells, all sorts of other bits and pieces there. So have a look at that. There's a fantastically good selection of models. And uh, not only have we got David Fletcher coming back doing his, we've just been doing some planning as well. We won't be able to hold the modelling event this year, that's been cancelled. But with the success we had with our online tank fest, we're thinking of doing an online modelling event. So watch this space, we'll tell you about it, when we're doing, what we're doing. So we've got some nice ideas there about showing you some of the models in the collection we've already got that don't really get seen. Some of the people we know who are good, keen model makers, some of those lovely stories and uh, all sorts of other things that we can hopefully interest you model makers are out there. And all the rest of you, of course, if you like that sort of stuff. So uh, keep safe, keep coming in with the questions and uh, say hello if you do pop into the museum. We are open, as I keep saying, so, you know, um, I hope this does lead you either to, you know, I hope you enjoy yourself, buy something if you've got the money to, or come and give us a visit. But um, thank you very much, and uh, thanks from the dog. Bye-bye. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel, and, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organisation, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.